don't you go ahead and uh, introduce yourself and your role here at Nightmare? Okay. I'm Warren Strobel. I am the Senior Correspondent for Foreign Affairs here at the uh, Knight Ritter Washington Bureau, which means I cover uh, foreign policy and also I uh, work with my colleagues in covering intelligence matters. Okay. National security as well. Okay, so during the, the buildup to the war in Iraq, what kind of, uh, you know, you know how, first of all, how would you evaluate the mainstream corporate, you know, print journalism leading up to the war in Iraq? Leading up to the war in Iraq. Uh, you mean outside of Knight Ritter? Yeah. Or corporately? Um, I guess I think for, to a large degree, the media missed the story. They were way too uh, willing to sort of bend to, or what's the word? too willing to uh, listen to what the administration had to say and not be critical of it. And I think that was largely a result of sort of post 9-11 psychosis uh, after the 9-11 attacks. A lot of the media, the print media, and I think even more so the broadcast media was willing to give the administration the benefit of the doubt. And that's what happened on Iraq. There were some critical articles, but not nearly enough. Okay. And um, I think a lot of what you see the administration trying to do now is pin the blame all on the Central Intelligence Agency. Can you speak to, to your some of your reporting that you've done even before the war, some of the debates and everything. Yeah, yeah, that's, um, I think it's fair to say there's a lot of blame to go around, and the CIA and the other intelligence agencies deserve some of that blame, but it's pretty clear that that was only a small part of the problem, and our reporting shows that, in fact, the CIA did at times try to throw up roadblocks or cautions, and that really the driving force behind the war was not the CIA. It wasn't the fact that the CIA or the DIA or the NSA uh, came up with new, dramatic new intelligence that said there's a huge new threat here we have to deal with. The decision to go to war was quite clearly made, uh, if not before 9-11, right after 9-11. And they pressured the intelligence agencies again and again to come up with evidence to fit their sort of preconceived notions. And you, when you say pressure, I think there's a, that's, a, that's the second phase of the Senate intelligence you know, uh, investigation. What have you kind of uncovered, or uh, what do you hear from some of your sources as the tactics to use, repetitive? tasking orders, and et cetera. Yeah, it's very interesting. The Senate Intelligence Committee report, which came out just a few days ago, uh, the report says that there was no pressure, that he couldn't find evidence of pressure on analysts, but we were clearly told, excuse me, we were clearly told that there was in specific cases. For example, um, in late 2001, early 2002, the Office of the Undersecretary of Defense for Policy, Douglas Fife, he set up a two-man operation to look for links between Iraq and Al-Qaeda. And this group of people, who weren't trained intelligence analysts, by the way, uh, came up with a, uh, what we're told is a very sophomoric kind of report showing that there were a lot of links in the relationship between Iraq and Al-Qaeda. That report was briefed to the CIA and others in the Pentagon. And uh, we're told by people in the CIA, fairly senior people, that it, it was a form of pressure because it forced them to go back again and again and again and to check their own analysis and uh, to find out why they hadn't found out the same thing. So that's one clear form of pressure. And I think the same thing happened in other instances as well. Repeated questioning of an analysts about why they came to conclusions and why their conclusions didn't mesh with what Cheney and Bush and others wanted to hear. Okay, and uh, looking at a lot of the bylines, I see a lot of collaboration. Can you talk about the collaborative process and, and what types of insights you get when you get reporters from totally different perspectives or sources? You mean here at Knight Ritter? Yeah. yeah um, we, I think that our reporting was a product of just, it wouldn't have happened if different individuals had been involved. Um, there was the two main reporters, myself and Jonathan Landay, um, an editor, John Walcott, who's a bureau chief here, who very aggressively encouraged us to pursue this story. It wouldn't have happened without him. And um, Renee Schoof, our, uh, our immediate supervisor and assistant editor here, who was also integral to the process. I think all of us did bring different perspectives. Um, I have a lot of experience covering intelligence, national security in Washington. My colleague Jonathan Landay is dogged, more dogged than I am, and just would not let go. And we had a, a bureau chief here who has been covering national security in this town for 25 years. And to him, something just didn't smell right when the administration started making its case for war. And he pushed us to, uh, to do the reporting that we did. So it was a collaborative process, and it was, uh, it was a lot of fun. We were doing something that nobody else at the time was really doing, with very few exceptions. And do you see that a tribute that no one else is doing it because they're too big and you can be you know, more scrap and you know, talk to the more blue collar workers or talk about you know, why, what do you attribute? Why, why do we do things differently? You know, why, why is it that you're doing a lot of reporting that no one else is really looking at or doing? 
That's a good question. I think part of it is you have like the huge news media organizations like the Washington Post and the New York Times and the networks. I don't want to be overly critical of them, but they, um, they need access. They prize their access to the White House and to the top levels of the Pentagon and the top levels of the State Department. And so I think they were more willing to listen and to take at face value um, a lot of what the administration had to say. Um, and as I said, there's also this post-9-11 problem where nobody could criticize the president on national security issues for some time. You could, but it, it was harder to do so. So that's definitely one of the issues. Another issue is we had people talking to us, sort of, as you said, the blue-collar blue workers. The, uh, we tend to call them the, um, the professionals. And when I say professionals, I mean intelligence analysts, uniformed military, and U.S. diplomats who were expert in Iraq, expert in the Middle East had done this stuff their whole careers. And they kept telling us over and over again that their views were being ignored, that the process was being politicized, that strange things were going on, that a separate, almost alternate government was being set up, different reporting channels, um, and so on and so forth. And I think what happened is they were talking to other members of the media as well. Obviously, they just didn't come to Knight Ritter. They went to others. But we took them a lot more seriously. We followed up very aggressively on what they had to say. And in the end, we found that their version of reality was more um, accurate than the version of reality that the White House was trying to put out. So in other words, a lot of these sources were actually telling you that they were trying to go up the higher, higher on the food chain of, you know, say the New York Times, Washington Post, or wherever, that they were being ignored by a lot of editors? Yeah, I, ignored is not the right word. It wasn't the editors. It's so much, I, well, I don't know. I can't speak to ed what was happening in, with editors at other news organizations, but I think they weren't getting through to the reporters at the other news organizations uh, in the way they wanted to. And they came to us, and what happens in these situations is we wrote a few stories that broke news and established our credibility as a major player in the story, and then more and more people started coming to us. Hmm. Okay. And, um, now, did you cover a lot of the, uh, the State Department and uh, the diplomatic, um, you know, uh, with the, the UN Security Council and everything? Were you following that beat? Yeah, simultaneously to, as I said, I had this sort of dual role where I was... Um, okay, yeah, well, now, when I'm, uh, I'm going to be editing my, uh, my uh, question out, so if I need to stop you and read, so it can stand on its own. Right? Okay. So, um, you just started like, you know, I was also... Okay, I'll try and, try and do that. Yeah, I was also uh, covering um, both the national security intelligence aspects as well as the, the diplomatic aspects. I covered the UN Security Council resolution, um, sort of the diplomacy or lack of diplomacy with other countries leading up to the war in Iraq, and uh, the efforts to put together a coalition such as it was, and uh, in, the, in the intervening months I've covered sort of the post-war policy and the, uh, the transition to Iraqi sovereignty. And can you kind of talk on a general terms of how does this administration view international law and the United Nations as a whole you know, leading up to the war in Iraq? What is your perspective of how they view that whole process? Um, I'll try and do my best. I'm not sort of an expert on that subject. I guess it was fairly clear that the administration had made up its mind what it wanted to do. And while it's sort of gave lip service to the idea of multilateralism. It really wanted to do what it wanted to do, and the other countries were free to join, but if they didn't, um, so be it. Which is quite different from the Clinton administration, which some people say went too far in the other direction, that they wouldn't do anything unless they had full international support and everybody was on board. Um, in terms of the actual uh, legality of the invasion, um, again, I'm not an international legal expert, but it's pretty clear to me that the Bush administration uh, wanted to have it both ways. They said that from the beginning they had the legal authority to do this because of the resolutions that were passed right after the first Gulf War. Uh, and that Saddam had, and he did, Saddam did violate those resolutions. So they said, we have the uh, authority way back there. But they also wanted to try and get additional authority from the United Nations to do this. And of course they ultimately failed at least to get the second resolution specifically authorizing war. So in your did you talk to any international law experts to see what their perspective of, of uh, the legality of the legal case of, of, that the Bush administration was? I think um, some people are probably better than I on this subject, but international legal experts, I think, were probably divided on this question. And there was another question that came up, too, which is the question of the legality or permissibility of a preemptive war or a preventive war, which are actually two different things. and. Uh, I think my understanding is that a preventive war is uh, 
no, I'm just, I messed this up. Um, preemptive versus preventive. I think a preemptive war is legal in the sense if you're under, you're a nation that's under immediate threat of attack and can prove that, then that's okay. But a preventive war, which, when the evidence is much more murky, that is not okay. So that was another huge issue about, you know, Bush's policy in Iraq was part of a lar larger policy about preventive, preemptive war. And whether that was in fact legal or not was one of the one of the main issues. Also, let me say, I mean, there are a lot of people in this administration who have a much different view of international law and its role in American foreign policy than previous administrations have had. And there are this administration, from the very start, came in um, determined to uh, make sure that U.S. sovereignty was less encumbered by international treaties and so forth. You saw Kyoto um, getting rid of that. Uh, you saw the International Criminal Court unsigning of that. Uh, there's a protocol on biological weapons convention that we refused to sign. Uh, there's several other examples of that. And that was a direct result of the philosophy of some of these people who felt that there should be no restraints on American power to do what, is it, what it wants. And in fact, those restraints are dangerous for the world. And, and so when you look in, in hindsight, and even before, what, from your sense, why did the United States go to war in Iraq? Everything that we know now about the situation. That's a good question. Why did we go to war in Iraq? Um, I think a lot of it, I have to believe in my heart of hearts that, uh, and again, I'm not trying to be political here, but just analyzing it from a journalist's point of view. I have to believe that Bush and Cheney really believed that they were doing the right thing. And they truly, after 9 11, they felt that there was uh, threats out there that had to be handled in a different way. But the sad fact of the matter is that the intelligence did not support that assessment. And I think you'll find a lot of terrorism experts who tell you that um, the war on terrorism suffered a setback. It hasn't been a plus for the war on terrorism. It's been a negative. So that's, uh, that's one reason we went to war. I think another reason we went to war is there's a very, very skillful, powerful lobbying effort. Uh, people from the Iraqi exiles, particularly the Iraqi National Congress, coupled with members of Congress who wanted to see Saddam gone coupled, frankly, with uh, pro-Israeli, pro-Jewish groups that wanted to see Saddam gone because Iraq was a threat to Israel, uh, coupled with neoconservative thinkers in and out of government. You put all those together and they, they made a fairly powerful force for war. It's a force that Bush could have stopped if he wanted to or could have countered, but in the end he didn't. And talk about, you know, kind of the legality of the Iraqi National Congress. I mean, Jonathan did a, a report on you know, the, the source of their funding and then using that funding to actually lobby to change U.S. government and the legality of that. Right. The INC, as we understand it, is currently under investigation by the General Accounting Office, which is Congress' investigative arm, to look into the question of whether they used U.S. funds illegally to lobby. Um, when the United States gives funds to uh, 501c3 groups, uh, nonprofit groups, um, there is generally a prohi prohibition about taking those taxpayer funds, your money and my money, and using it to lobby the U.S. government. Because it's like paying to lobby ourselves, basically. Whether that occurred or not is so still an open question, but we have talked to people at the State Department and elsewhere, some people on Capitol Hill who believe, in fact, that happened. Which, if, if true, and I'm not saying it is true, but if true, it would be a violation of the law. And it's, the INC did some really interesting things in sort of set, setting up two or three different units, different organizations, different front companies almost to, to deal with the, the, the money that they received. And of course, um, there are at least two U.S. government agencies, namely the CIA and the State Department, which uh, believe that they did not properly account for the U.S. government funds that they, uh, that they had. And we know that Ahmed Chalami, the head of the INC, is now uh, under suspicion of, uh, of other things. In, not him person, personally necessarily, but his group is under suspicion of having passed U.S. secrets to Iran. And during the buildup to the Excuse me. to the war in Iraq, when you're looking at both your sources and reading the newspaper coverage, but also listening to the administration, can you isolate some instances where some red flags went up that didn't really make sense to you that made you push harder to do some more reporting? Um, there were several red flags. Um, the first for me is just having covered the Middle East for a long time. Um, I knew that there was not supposed to be. Most people didn't believe there was a lot of cooperation between Sunni um, terrorist groups, radical theological groups like bin Laden's, and largely secular governments like Saddam Hussein's. 
and other secular governments. I knew that Al-Qaeda was largely not a state-sponsored organization. In fact, it was a non-state actor. And when the administration started talking about cooperation between Iraq and Al-Qaeda, I just, it, it threw up a lot of red flags. Um, there had never been any evidence of that before. Um, and it didn't make sense to me from Saddam's perspective to be engaged in helping Al-Qaeda for several reasons. First of all, Saddam and many other secular leaders in the Middle East had always been very uh, careful not to help uh, Islamic groups. Uh, they'd been in fact afraid that those groups would turn and overthrow them. That's one reason. Um, a second reason, Saddam was a control freak and he didn't want to give up any power. And the idea that he would turn his weapons of mass destruction programs, um, if he had them, over to Al-Qaeda when these WMD programs were the most um, valuable thing he had just didn't seem to make sense. And plus what we knew of Iraq's sponsorship for state terror, or state sponsorship of terrorism had mostly to do with rhetorical and financial funding of uh, Palestinian groups that were fighting uh, the Israeli occupation. So that all just didn't make sense. And then my colleague John Lande, um, who is more expert than I in some of the nuclear issues, when the administration started talking about aluminum tubes that might be uh, used for Iraq's nuclear effort and the uh, uranium that it was supposed to be getting from Africa. All those things just did not add up to him. So you combine that with what we were hearing from our sources in the government and it just kept us pushing us to ask more. And you know, I, I, it's not for me to criticize other members of the media, but you do have to wonder what would have happened if the entire media establishment in this country had taken a different stance from the time of, let's say, the end of the war in Afghanistan in December, January of 2002 and the start of the invasion. Would it have changed history? Would, the United, would Bush not have invaded? Would the Congress not have gone along? I don't know, but it's a question worth asking. Okay. And um, in your sense, why did the administration go from saying we don't need a second resolution to switching to now they said we're going to go after it even though we don't think we need it? There was a switch at the end of January. Can you speak to why you think they made that switch? I think, and this is partly based on my own reporting, but also based on what I've read and heard, is that there's only one reason why they did that, and that's Britain. Okay, hold on. Go ahead. Did what? I'm sorry. Um, there's only one reason, and as far as I can tell from my reporting and reading, that they went for the second resolution, and that's the UK. They had very few international partners in this venture in Iraq, um, and the only major one, really, other than the United States, was Britain. And Tony Blair needed the second resolution politically at home because he was pursuing a policy that most of his countrymen, most of his constituents disagreed with. So there were a lot of people advising Bush, and I think including probably Cheney and Rumsfeld, I'm almost certain of it, who didn't want to go for a second resolution. We've tried the UN route, it's failed, let's go to war. Um, but Bush said, no, Blair is my partner in this, he stood up for me, he's backed me, he says he needs a second res resolution, let's do it. And I assume Powell probably wanted to go for, I'm certain Powell wanted to go for a second resolution too. And can you talk about some of the splits between the State Department and defense, you know, the kind of struggle with, you know, Powell was kind of cast at this, this dove or someone who wanted to take the more legal route of, of going to the UN and, you know, can you talk about generally like the different forces and the factions that were fighting each other over that? Yeah, let me try and do that. I have to go back a few steps. Um, I guess in this, the, I've covered every administration since Reagan, since Reagan's second term in terms of um, national security and foreign policy. And there's always been splits between the State Department and the Defense Department, between the White House and the State Department and so forth. But in this administration, they're more bitter, they're more severe, they're more persistent, they never get resolved. So that kind of underlay the whole Iraq policy. Um, and um, certainly Powell, it's funny, Powell, some people want to paint Powell as a dove, and he's, he's not. He's a moderate. He might even be to the right of moderate. But compared to some of the other people in this administration, I guess he was dovish. And um, I think the policy that was ultimately pursued, the invasion, is certainly not the policy that would have happened had he been president or even a more powerful secretary of state. Um, the one victory he did win was convincing Bush that they had to go the UN route, at least to make a try of it. And again, as I said previously, Cheney and Rumsfeld didn't probably want to pursue the UN route at all, and Powell was able to convince Bush to do that. But they didn't really pursue it to the end. And they didn't pursue it, they pursued it half-heartedly. Half they pursued it in a divided manner, with some people in Washington wanting to go forward and some people in Washington not. And they were blocked at every turn, frankly, by the European 
allies, allies isn't even the right word, but they were blocked by the Europeans who fundamentally disagreed with the policy and were afraid of, uh, not just of Iraq, but of American power in general and the way American foreign policy was going. Um, and you saw that in specific instances where there, there would be negotiations up in New York over the content of the UN resolution. I'm talking about the first resolution. And back in Washington, there would be arguments over every paragraph and comma between the Defense Department and the State Department. And under Bush, I think you have a fairly weak National Security Council structure. Um, Condi Rice has not been able to sort of grab hold of the process and bring things to conclusion. So these debates never, ever get settled. And it doesn't make for smooth policy making at all. And Iraq is not the only example. And can you talk about, there was a eight weeks, I think, time period of 1441 where there were the United States wanted to have the resolution a certain way and the French wanted to have it another way. Can you talk about the nature of that particular disagreement and grievance? Yeah, I, th I think, is it 17 weeks? No, I've, I've forgotten how long it is, but it was, uh, it was amazing. It was just, uh, Powell worked on it like day in and day out, like almost like he was the desk officer for this. Um, and the, as these things often do, it came down to a difference of a preposition to uh, yeah, learn or. Yeah. That's going to so, blow it. Sorry. Yeah, when you say it, when you, you know, when you say, when you say like resolution 1441. So okay. Just wait for the phone. Okay. Um, what was I saying? We're talking about. Um, the nature of the disagreement of, uh, or the, the, the debate between uh, 1441, why was there, why did it take so long? To right. There was a bitter dispute over Resolution 1441 between the United States, France, Russia, Germany, and a few others, but it was primarily between the United States and France. And Powell and his counterpart from France argued, negotiated, debated every sentence of that thing and down to individual words. I've forgotten the exact word, but there was like a preposition, an and or an or, that uh, they finally had to negotiate. And it's actually very funny, the final deal came when Powell was walking his daughter down the aisle to be married. I think it was here in Washington, and he got a call on the phone from, um, from the French foreign minister who had finally agreed to the final U.S. proposal, and that's how they nailed it down. But it was bitterly, bitterly fought. And as I said, you, you have to think in terms of dual negotiations because you have this negotiation going on in New York. Uh, and in world capitals, Paris, London, United States, and then you have this negotiation within the Bush administration over, um, over what they were going to do. So it, it took a long time, it took a lot longer than, than they thought, and ultimately found that they did it once, but they obviously could not get the second resolution. And I think the, the nature of the, the grievance a lot was, you know, this hidden triggers, you know, no automaticity and no mm -hmm. hidden triggers. Can you speak about what was in that resolution and what that meant? Yeah, it's, uh, in terms of Resolution 1441 and the authorization for war, it's very funny. As so often happens in these diplomatic things, they settled with a compromise which allowed each side to read it exactly as they wanted. So each side could say that they got what they wanted. And by each side, I mean the French and the United States primarily, um, when in fact they had sort of papered over the issue. France believed that it had got in the resolution no automaticity. And the United States believed that it had basically gotten a green light for war if Saddam didn't do. X, Y, and Z. And of course they never believed Saddam was going to do X, Y, and Z. And even if he had done X, Y, and Z, it's unlikely the Bush administration would ever have acknowledged that, I think. And if you look at their legal, you know, justification, their legal justification was saying that we have authorization from 678 and 687, yeah. and that 1441 in a way didn't really give them. So when John Negroponte is saying there's no hidden triggers in this resolution, their legal argument was actually pointing to the resolutions 10 years prior. Yeah. So can you talk about, you know, do you see it that way as well, or? Um, yeah, I guess, how to put it? I think a lot of their legal argument was based on the previous resolutions that were passed in the immediate aftermath of the Gulf War. Um, and they sort of always, when they were challenged, they always fell back on, he's in violation of these resolutions, which, I mean, that was their strategy. I think, you know, I have to uh, say Saddam sort of left himself open to that because he did invade Iran and then he did invade Kuwait and he did sign these resolutions that uh, largely he did not live up to. But I'm not saying that, you know, that's an argument to go to war in 2003 or not, but Saddam sort of left himself open to that charge, left, it, left a big loophole or a big hole that 
the Bush administration was able to drive through. But the sad fact is to me that in history books, I think, you know, fundamentally people will look back and say that this was not a war that was internationally legitimized. I don't think, um, obviously the Bush administration would make a very different argument and say they did have the authority and the legitimacy, but uh, it, when you go to war like this, you want to have the entire world behind you and you want to have the international community say that this invasion of Iraq is a uh, legitimate, necessary thing that's been um, approved by the United Nations, and the history books aren't going to show that, and be, this is going to be debate forever about whether it was the right thing to do or not. And it's not my place to say whether it was the right thing to do it. And but I guess one question that you know, if you take that stance, what who is the sovereign authority to enforce the resolutions? You know, you know who can can the United States do it unilaterally, or is it only the, the United Nations Security Council? And I think that's where there's a, a debate. Um, can you talk about both sides of that, and you know, where kind of where you see that? Yeah, or maybe if I could take the question in a little bit of a di different direction. One of our problems in the Middle East and around the world is the fact that for, we are the most powerful member of the UN Security Council. We have veto power, one of the, obviously the most powerful country in the world. There's a perception out there that we enforce or demand enforcement of UN Security Council resolutions selectively. We demand that Saddam Hussein live up to such and such a resolution. Uh, we demand that Sudan live up to such and such a resolution. But when it comes to other countries, Israel being one of them, we don't demand the same level of, of enforcement. And people um, see that as unfair and not right. And some people would even say it feeds the, um, if not hatred, at least uh, unhappiness with American policy in the region. But I guess in a, the, the question could also be who is the sovereign authority to those, those resolutions? resolutions. I guess it's the, again, I'm not an international legal expert, but I guess what I have to say is the UN Security Council resolution, so it's the UN Security Council that determines whether it's enforced or how it's enforced. Um, but there, that's, I mean, that's sort of an th international legal thing, but as a practical matter, the United States and a few other countries really run the Security Council. So I guess that's, when I talk to international legal experts, they say, you know, that's a big problem is that you know, that, that there is no sovereign authority in a way that it's, it's up to the individual member states to do it and that officially it should only be the, the council that's enforcing these resolutions. But you have uh, both the Democrats, Republicans, and a lot of the media seeing that international law as a political issue. You know, is international law a political issue or is it a legal issue? In yeah. America? I guess it's both. I mean, in reality, I don't... I don't know. I, I don't know what else. I mean, would, I don't know if you'd have the UN, not the Security Council, but the UN itself, the UN staff enforce resolutions. I don't think that would work very well. Um, I just don't know how to answer that question. I'm sorry. Okay. Um, and you wrote a book about um, you know talking about the breaking news and its effect on you know foreign policy. Can you kind of give a gist of, of, of how that may have played out in this particular war, or you know what that particular you know, what your points were in that. Yeah, my book was published in 1997 by the U.S. Institute of Peace. It was called Late Breaking Foreign Policy, and it looked more at the issue of how the U.S. news media affects foreign policy decisions, particularly in terms of deployment of troops overseas. And I started from the premise of a lot of people believe that the coverage of starvation in Somalia, news coverage of starvation in Somalia in 1990-91 uh, um, got Bush, the father, to intervene in Somalia with troops. And just a few months later, the coverage of uh, bodies being dragged through the streets of Mogadishu uh, and the American military failures there got American troops to be pulled out of Somalia. And obviously, if the news media has that much power over foreign policy, that's bad because um, you know you can't run your foreign policy and you can't make decisions in terms of other countries and national security based on just what the news media is reporting. Doing my research, I actually found out that effect, which some people call the CNN effect, is exaggerated. And I think the whole Iraq episode kind of validates my thesis, which is that the media does have a lot of impact on foreign policy, but in fact our power just doesn't stand up to the power that the President and the Congress have in terms of setting the agenda and deciding what's to be done. Okay, and, okay, one, 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 one. Now, I guess another, you know, a lot of what the administration's argument now is trying to make this Iraq war as a purely humanitarian cause. Can you talk about, you know, from your point of view, does that hold up for what the justifications were to go to the war in Iraq? It's interesting because that was a very small, the, the humanitarian part of the war, uh, the suffering of the Iraqi people under the sanctions and the suffering under uh, 
Saddam Hussein's government was a very small part of the administration's case for war. They did include it, but it was sort of the fourth thing, a sort of an add-on after you talk about Iraq's support for terrorism, Iraq's weapons of mass destruction, and a, you know, a couple of other major issues. Then they sort of said, and Saddam's a horrible leader and so forth. So that wasn't what they emphasized when they went to war. You do see them emphasize it a little bit more now, I think, you know, talking about how Iraqis are freer and happier now that Saddam is gone. Saddam was a bastard. I mean, let's be clear about that. I was in Iraq four times during Saddam's rule, and he was one of the worst rulers on earth, but that's not the case that they made. It's not the case that they emphasized um, on going to war. And I think, I guess we'll see, in, you know, the American public will have to make its own choice in November about whether they feel it's interesting, this election, more than any other election I can remember in a long time, is going to be about just one thing. It's really going to be a referendum on Bush's policies in Iraq and on the war on terrorism. And at, when you were, did you do a lot of uh, talking to other diplomats from other embassies when you're governing? Are you mostly interacting with, uh, you know, Richard Boucher? Or who do you, when you're, when you're covering the, the diplomatic beat, are you getting different perspectives from other ambassadors, and what, what was their perspective? Yeah, I mean, in covering the diplomatic beat, you it's kind of a fun beat because you get to cover not only the State Department and what Richard Boucher and Colin Powell are saying, but you also get to cover the other embassies. And here in Washington, there's a huge variety of think tanks with very noted experts from all different parts of the world and all different political views or analytic views. So you try and touch base with as many people as possible. Um, I think what I was picking up was a lot of concern about post-war Iraq. Because even long before March 2003, it had become clear that the war was going to happen. I mean, we had night written a story in January 2002 saying Bush had essentially decided that Saddam had to go and was working on the policies to make Saddam go. So you knew from there was an extraordinarily long run up to the war. And um, there was a lot of concern both at the embassies and in the sort of the academic community about whether the administration had prepared adequately for post-war Iraq. And of course, we now know that they hadn't. Do you, can you isolate a point when you kind of saw that war was in inevitable, that war was going to happen regardless of what was going on in the UN or anywhere else? Yeah, there were several points. I mean, one was the story that I, there were several points at which I became increasingly convinced that war was going to happen. Um, one was January 2002, I believe. January 2002, me and John Walcott and John Landay did a story talking to our sources that basically said, Bush had decided Saddam has to go and he hasn't decided there's going to be a war or he's going to try and start a coup or what have you, but Saddam has to go. That's now the policy, which was a big change. Um, then move the ball ahead a little bit to say August of 2002, and Cheney gave a very, Cheney really began the selling of the war in August of 2002 with two speeches. One was, I think, at the VFW, and I forget where the second one was, um, and especially in the first speech, they toned down the second speech a little bit, but the first speech, Cheney basically made it clear that they were headed towards war. And he accused, if I'm not mistaken, uh, Saddam of having reconstituted his nuclear weapons. He basically came this close to saying Saddam had a nuclear weapon, which was ridiculous. So those are two points. Um, and then there's some other points along the way in terms of the diplomacy at the United Nations where it became clear they weren't going to get the uh, second resolution. And then you knew that Bush was sort of committed to this course, but uh, it wasn't a big surprise. Okay, and let me just see if there's any other questions here. Um, now, did, did you hear about, you know, this, uh, in the London Observer, there was a report from an NSA memo that was, that was published on like March 2nd, which was, you know, the war started on March 19th, but March 2nd, that Frank Caza had ordered the NSA to, you know, the United Kingdom to start spying and do some illicit, illicit, you know, espionage on the different diplomats at the United Nations. And then a week later, Catherine Gunn was an unnamed, you know, uh, government official who was arrested for leaking the memo. Did you, did that, did you see that at all, or do you look at the foreign press um, when you're um, covering the diplomatic beat and? 
Is that on your radar screen? Yeah, I mean, covering the diplomatic beat, you do have to cover the foreign press or read it as much as possible, usually in English translation if it's from Arabic or something. So uh, the issue about the U.S. spying on the United Nations Security Council members, yeah, it was on my radar screen. But as, uh, as I recall, it happened so close to the actual outbreak of war that it sort of got overtaken by events. Um, I have to say, I didn't do any direct reporting of my own on that story, but it didn't surprise me at all that we spy on our allies. I mean, it's done. Okay. And I think that's, that's it. Do you have any other thoughts about No. No, I'm just, I don't think there's anything uh, we haven't covered. If you've got any questions later on, you just want to go over by phone or something. Okay. I hope sure. that was helpful. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Good. Yeah.